So, welcome everybody to turn SolidWorks into your kinematic whiteboard. Real quick, uh, your presenters today are myself, Brandon Elms down at the bottom, and Ryan up at the top. Uh, we are both senior application engineers. Uh, Ryan is based out of our office in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm based out of Indianapolis. So we're here uh, to show you a little bit more about kinematic sketching. So when I think, or when we think of me mechanism design, you know, it usually goes something like this. I've got an idea in my brain and I need to get that down on paper, right? So what do I do? Go to a whiteboard, right? And work it out. Uh, certainly using, you know, best practices of always, you know, marking save on the whiteboard, right? So we don't lose our great idea. And then, of course, later that day, you know, there's a big meeting and the team is kind enough to erase everything, but keep the save note, right? Uh, but the, not the rest of my idea. Um, you know, sometimes we may even use pencil and paper to capture ideas so we don't lose them. But, you know, what happens when we come to SolidWorks? We have to start all that work over again, right? And hopefully we didn't do any scaling incorrectly on that first go around on the paper. So. What if we were able to create an interactive 2D sketch system that not only could we move around, but we could even update for use for downstream part creation. You know, we might even be able to gain some valuable insight and design guidance, right? Before we ever create any SolidWorks part. And that's the concept of kinematic sketching into 2D creation. Right, so that's what this is all about. So if that's what you were hoping for, you're in the right spot. I'm going to go ahead and start off with the basics of the 2D work and then pass the ball over to my colleague, Ryan, who's going to jump in and take us through the transformation of that 2D content into 3D. And then Ryan will talk a little bit more about all kinds of different insights that we can get along the way with this kind of a process. So let's go ahead and get started with the 2D work. And for that, we're gonna dive into creating assembly layouts. So how can we make these self-contained 2D sketches called blocks? And lastly, how can we relate those entities together with relationships that's almost like thinking of mates for assemblies? So we'll start first with creating an assembly layout. To start this process off, we're going to create an assembly. I'll go ahead and select the assembly template I want to cr and create a new document. Most of us just use assemblies, well, you know, to start assembling parts together, and we ignore a huge, powerful tool, this thing called assembly layout. So create assembly layout. If we select this create layout button, we activate the assembly layout tools and activate a plane for sketching. SolidWorks opens the Command Manager tab for the layout tools, and you can see we have traditional sketch tools available. We're also presented with these cool sketch blocks tools, which we'll touch on more in a little bit. And we've already got an active sketch loaded on the front plane to begin our work. Since we're using since we're used to whiteboard setup, I'll orient my view normal. And I know I'm in an active sketch because the confirmation corner even is changed to this exit layout and cancel. I can exit my layout mode if I want to do other assembly work. And of course, if I want to relaunch the assembly layout, I just right select from the top of the tree. Now in this layout mode, I have an active sketch and all the tools I need to create my layout available right on the command manager. So the key here is that you can create these kinematic 2D sketches with just one click. And you're gonna have all the tools needed right at your fingertips right there on the command manager. So now let's talk about these things called sketch blocks. So 
Sketch blocks can almost be thought of as like 2D parts. We simply draw the geometry we want to use as the connecting linkages and add any necessary driving dimensions or relations to capture our design intent within that part file itself. I don't have to worry about fully defining this sketch. All I really need to do is capture those dimensions and relations which are critical to the design. Now, I know some of you might be checking out because undefined sketches, what are you talking about? Well, don't worry. That's what this whole make block is for, right? We simply select the geometry that we want to include in the block as well as defining an insertion point. And SolidWorks creates the block that gathers all the corresponding internal relationships and dimensions to those sketch entities. So here's the insertion point. And as we progress through our design, we can continue to create blocks out of the respective linkages. Again, selecting all the entities we want, including sketch points that can be used as pivot points, we can also adjust the insertion point, which controls where any other blocks would be inserted in the future. So the next time I insert this block, that's when I click, that's where that block will go in. Now we don't have to be in our layout to create sketch blocks. Sketch blocks can be created in any file, maybe even like a new part file. Similar to what we've done before, we add sketch entities with dimensions and relations as required. And if we know we need a pivot point somewhere else, we just add in sketch points using the SOLIDWORKS point tool in our sketch tools and add driving dimensions as required. Once I've exited my sketch, I can turn any block any sketch into a block by going to Tools, Blocks, Save. You do want to be careful about where you save blocks. You want to be sure you don't bury the path. Uh, we can explain that a little bit later. But once we've saved the block, we don't even need to save the part. Now back in the assembly, I can use the layout tools to insert blocks as well. And this is why it's important not to bury the location. Usually SOLIDWORKS will stop at the top level directory when inserting blocks, so it makes it life just easier to insert it there, have it in a close folder so we don't have to navigate all over the place. And when I want to add another block, I just navigate to that file. And when I click the graphics to insert the part, you can see the insertion point is used. Now, when you insert blocks, you also have the option to control the scale of the block and its rotated angle upon insertion. We can even link back to the original sketch block file to monitor changes as necessary. So as part of the 2D process, know that you can create blocks on the fly or you can use existing blocks. The last part of the 2D process is adding in the relationships between the blocks, which can almost be thought of like mating. Now, from a workflow standpoint, once we've got our block ready, we're ready to start adding relations. Since this block is all self-contained, we can drag and drop it on the assembly origin. It's almost like mating. As you can see, we can pivot the part until we add a horizontal relation the assembly. When working with linkages, sketch points are what we use to be sure to add the relations where we want. As we work, we can see each sketch block is self-contained, so we don't need to worry about the underdefined sketches we talked about earlier. And they all move relative to the relationships we've established at an assembly level.
We need to connect our last link in the assembly along with the hold down part. So far, we've used the drag and drop method of adding relations, but we can also use the relationship pop-up as well. Just control select multiple elements, and we get the opportunity to add in our relations just like QuickMates. Now that we can see our full range of motion and moving linkage system, we can see it moving around and try doing that on a whiteboard. During the process of reviewing this design, we figured out we need to change the design and we can edit the block to see those changes quickly. So using a D shortcut just to bring the command down, confirmation corner down, and there's control Q to rebuild. And now we see our new range of motion with a changed dimension. Very quick and easy to see what that range of motion looks like before we ever built any parts or any assembly. So with mating the blocks, we can see motion earlier and we can see an assembly style mating of these 2D shapes. So we can go even further with this analysis. So what if we need to size a motor? Need a cool motor like this. What most people don't know is that the simulation en engine will also use the sketch solver. So if we add forces to a model, you just size the motor before any parts are created. So we're adding forces to represent what strength we want. We've added a motor in here to show what type of uh, linear actuator motor we want. And then our results can show us what that magnitude of that force is for the motor force. And you can see we can solve that. This will be important. Ryan will come back to this a little bit later, but we solved it before ever creating any parts. It's all done with the sketches in the assembly. So with 2D work, know that it is possible to do with a one-click creation style. We can create blocks on the fly, and it allows us to see motion earlier. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand over the presentation to Ryan to show us the 3D work. All right, so a lot of really great stuff there that we just saw Brandon do with 2D. Uh, or creating those kinematic blocks. Uh, now, how do we not waste that work? Right? We want to leverage that uh, into 3D. So we can do that. A couple of a couple of things we can do there. We can use that those blocks to create our 3D models. Uh, we can do all our assembly design. Here, we're going to reference one model to another uh, within context design. And then leverage those 2D sketch blocks and see how design changes can affect our work. So let's first see how we can convert those blocks over into 3D geometry. So as you see here, we still have our 2D kinematic motion, uh, but what's great is with each of these sketch blocks, we can make a part. When we do that, uh, what we can do is we can choose uh, make a part and we have the ability to choose either to be on the block if we're gonna, if we're intending to be constrained coplanar with that block, or we can pr project and just be parallel to it there. And just a real quick thing, uh, tech tip here, just how I like to exit out of these is just the, with the mouse gestures, I kind of just swipe across there to uh, exit out of that command. So similar to the D key. Here, uh, choosing a template is a system option. Uh, we've created that part from the block. It has features just like any other part, but the first feature is the sketch geometry we created. We can open that part. Here, that part was saved virtually, but again, that's a system option where it can be saved to external part if we want. And from here, uh, we can just use it as our starting point to draw our geometry. Or in this case, we can directly use the sketch geometry from the block, or just use it as a guide to create our base design. This is gonna be a, the base piece, so I'm gonna use, you see that auto transition tool to create our arcs around those corners there, and we'll finish it off with that arc at the bottom. 
And what's cool about this is we're working uh, right with those relations and, and sketch entities, which are tied back to that block. So if we ever want to go back in and change dimensions, um, it's going to be tied to this geometry already. So we'll just go in uh, with our normal method and put in some dimensions and add in some final relations to finish off that fully defined that sketch there. And we have our full arsenal of part features available as well. Um, here we're just going to do a mid-plane extrusion on that part. So now uh, we're going to use a tool called the Convert to Sheet Metal. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, it's a really powerful tool uh, because right here we want to have sort of like that hollowed out part that we're going to make out of sheet metal. And an easy way of doing that is create that simple blocky uh, material there. And we just use that um, and then with the Convert to Sheet Metal, tell it what we want to be our flat face, what edges we want to bend, and then SOLIDWORKS will automatically convert that into the sheet metal, as we saw there with the flat pattern, cutlass properties, um, everything we need to make that part is all that information is right there. Now back over here in the assembly, uh, we have our motion starting to sh take shape with those 3D parts, right? The pos position updates based off of those blocks. And you see the next part that we want to work off, the sketches are going down the center but the parts aren't gonna be there. So now we're gonna use that project option. So once we select this option, nothing is really different yet. Uh, this is going to be uh, another easy one like we just did. Uh, we'll just use that sketch and make a sheet metal part based off of the, the flange, uh, sheet metal flange out of it. So back over here in the assembly, uh, the motion is still tied to that block. However, uh, I now have the added ability to move that part normal to that initial sketch block plane. Now, uh, in the, like we're in, we're in an assembly, so now I can start using my assembly mates uh, to position that component. Right? And the motion is still going to follow those sketch blocks. All right, so now we're going to go ahead in and just do the same thing for that link in the middle there, but we're going to do it slightly different and take our first look at sort of getting into in context editing there. Uh, we create that new part from the block, but in this time, instead of opening it, uh, we can edit that part right within the assembly itself. So now we're in part mode um, while we're still in the assembly. So we can get access to all of that part functionality, right? Because we're in the part within the context of the assembly. So we'll do the same thing here we did with the last part, just make a sheet metal base flange. And since we're in project mode, uh, we can make this part into place. And now our 3D design based off of those sketch blocks, right, again, is really starting to take, take shape here. And then lastly, if we want to turn off the layout sketch, simple right click on the top level assembly there, and we can hide the layout. All right, so skipping ahead a little bit here, I've added in a few other components. Uh, and some jogs to the arm, uh, which we'll get back to here in a little bit. And we'll look at some patterning techniques uh, within the assembly tools. So these are really powerful because now we don't have to use as many mates, right? We can just select the components, mirror them across, and the behavior will be the same. So this saves us, um, as well as SOLIDWORKS work, right? Of adding in more components, having to add in more mates uh, to get that same motion. And lastly, if we have unsaved virtual components, uh, we get that option to keep them inside the assembly or save them out to an external file. So the big thing here is how we don't have to waste that early work. Uh, we get the size and feel of it with the 2D blocks, then convert them to 3D geometry. One quick thing that we do want to point out is that project option, depending on what version you're using, uh, I think it was 2019 SP1. Um, it, there is like an overdefined error that we've seen for some reason. That has been reported. There's an SPR out there. So if you are experiencing that or looking to use this, uh, contact us or whoever your VAR is um, to get attached to that, um, that SPR and get that fixed. Uh, we can then uh, also leverage those assembly the assembly functionality, like the assembly patterns that we saw there, um, which saves us a lot of work uh, when creating, creating symmetric or patterned uh, designs. Okay, now let's talk about the in-context design. And this is really powerful functionality within assemblies, but it's also something that does scare a lot of people off right, if they don't understand it completely. Um, and simply put, right, it's just that ability to add features or add parts to feature, or add parts features to parts, or create new parts um, within the assembly. 
um, or in the context of the assembly, like we had mentioned earlier, and then be able to reference other parts to define those parts or features. So like we say here in this uh, example we see on the screen, we need a clearance there between to maintain between those two parts. We can dimension the one part off of the other, off of the, off of the other uh, to help give us that design intent that we're looking for. Let's go ahead and jump in and do that. And here we're going to come in and just start adding in some assembly features. Uh, they're all available to us here. And these are essentially like in context features that we're putting in. So we're going to put in some holes just like we normally do in our part files. But what's important here is we want to be able to define which components these features are going to go through. So what we're going to do is look at an often overlooked feature or an option in a lot of our features. Right? It's, it's called the feature scope. Where we can choose essentially uh, what components uh, we're going to apply this to. So we can have it select all or automatically select. Uh, but here we're just going to uncheck that, pick the components that we want. This is important, especially in maybe like mirrored components like we have here, because we don't want to pick the mirrored component because it's already in the first one. So it's going to propagate over uh, when that's mirrored. Another option that's in there is the ability to propagate those features down to the part and adding that external reference to them there. Because maybe we want to position them here at the assembly level so we know where they're going to be or where they're going through those multiple components. But we're not going to manufacture it or machine those at the assembly level. We want those to go back at the part level. So we're going to want those features to propagate down to the part themselves. So we have that option, right? And that's creating that in-context relationship there to that part. I'll do one more here with that method, then we'll jump into the option, another option just to get a little bit farther into that in-context design. So we, like I said, we're going to do one more, how to place it on this arm, but we're going to want to be able to position it based off of that linkage behind it there. So we want it centered on that arc that's behind there. Um, so choosing those components, we want to add in through the feature scope. Then we can go ahead in and position it. Um, that if we can see that arc, right, we can, you know, we can wake up that center and snap to that center point um, if we can see it, but here we can't. So we're going to turn on the hidden lines visible. Now we can see all those edges that are there for those other components. We can snap to that position of those based off of those other features there. All right, so now let's open up that arm and we can see those features were propagated down and what we have now is that symbol that looks like the little arrow pointing to the right, right? That's at our external reference symbol there. So these features are in the part, but they're positioned based off of something right in that other model or over in our assembly. That assembly file is what's positioning those holes there. So back over in the assembly, right? This is where people start to get frustrated, right? With the in-context design is when you rebuild it, maybe it blows up. So you just kind of avoid that altogether. Um, here it didn't because of the way those holes were positioned, right? They're still in the in the, the right spot there. But understanding what in context design is, uh, there are tools that we can leverage to help us avoid that. And one of the things that we can do is have that critical design position. What we're concerned about here is that jog making it over the arc. So it's really in that position when those two faces of the base and then that arm are coincident to each other. So we're just going to use that mate where we're going to use what's called four position only, uh, which is similar. It's like the blue inference line in our sketches. If you guys are familiar with those where it puts it in the position, but doesn't actually put in the mate. So now we still have the ability to go in and move that if we want. It's just sort of getting us back to that critical position uh, that we're going to be working at. So now if we edit this part. I want to add in a relation to where that jog is going to occur based off that other sketch geometry. So I'm doing that within that edit part or the edit com component um, option inside of the assembly. And this is a really important part here, right? When we're editing the part inside the assembly, it's assuming we want to try to select that other geometry. Um, and it's going to assume if we have, drop those lines, it's going to try to mate that to something else or create, the, I should say, create relations to something else there. And that's because, well, if you're doing this in the context of the assembly, that's probably what you want to do. Otherwise, maybe you could just open up the part and do it there. But if you pay attention really to the way you do it and just be intentional with those relations, right, this can be really powerful. Um, here, I just kind of draw it, like to draw it off um, a little bit from where I'm going to go and then go ahead in and put in the relations and be specific with the relations and the dimensions that I want to put in. So I only get the ones that I want and not the ones that I don't want, right, and have to go back in and delete those. 
just being very intentional with uh, the design there. All right, so you can see we added that in context relation to the bend, uh, but now it's where that jog occurs based on the geometry in that position. So if I go ahead and do the rebuild, right, this is where I start to get those errors because um, it's trying to dimension that one millimeter dimension off of that edge where, you know, when it's in that position, but now it's not, right? It's in another position. So maybe it's just moving a little, or maybe it's moving it off enough to cause that error there, right? That's propagating down from the assembly, and it's saying that that's taking us off the part, right? causing that error. This is where things can get a little bit frustrating with this method, but if we know what's going on, and we're intentional again with that design, right? We have a plan in place. Um, this can be a really great tool. And the one method that I like to use um, is putting in that extra mate there um, for that critical position that we want to be in. This time we'll actually put the mate in, not use the for position only option. So now we're locked in that position. So if we rebuild now, those errors go away because um, now those up, updates propagate down to the position that we want. Just like with the dimensions and features and you know whatnot, it's really good to give things names that make sense. So we'll call this one here the stationary mate. So this doesn't really solve our problem yet, right? Because now we don't have motion and it can't, we can't move it, right? But if I and if, and if we suppress that mate, we're back in the same boat where we just were. Or we move it and we're going to get an error. So that's what we're going to get into next. Um, is but we have that ability to lock those external references down so they don't propagate. Um, down into the part until we want them to. So using a stationary mate, um, again, most people don't want to use the in-context design because it's only relative maybe to a certain position. Uh, we can do that with the stationary mate. And, you know, it's good to label that as such. And then be sure to leverage those assembly features um, like pole wizard that we did and just be intentional with your in-context design. If you're intentional and you kind of have that plan, uh, know what's going on, right? Much better, much better chance for success with this. Okay, so let's talk about those design changes. All right, how does this happen and how can we change that mechanism? All right, we saw it from the 2D side. Brand did it earlier. It made sense and that was pretty easy. But now we've added some complexity of the in-context holes, the sketch jogs. So we have all this added complexity, but we still want to, and we also still want to see that motion, right? So this is where we're going to start leveraging something called lock references. Uh, first, uh, we want to make a change to the length of this linkage. What we're going to do now is go back to what Brandon did earlier, uh, which is those 2D sketches, uh, which has been driving this all along. If we go into edit that block, we can change that dimension there and then go ahead and rebuild. And it rebuilds in that position. Now we want to test that motion. So this is where we can utilize the stationary mate. So I'm going to go ahead in here. Um, utilizing something called breadcrumbs to access that. Um, hopefully everyone is familiar with those. Uh, you can see here those highlighted that popped up. Um, if you haven't used those and you just want to see them there, I highly recommend sticking with it, try it out and get used to it. I, re I really i am a big fan of those now that I've gotten into and start using them. Um, I use them all the time. And what they are is essentially a history of the selection that you made, right? So I selected a face. So there's the feature, the reference geometry mates, all of that can be referenced right there. Or you don't have to go over to the feature tree, go into the mates and find that mate, you know, and then go in and suppress it. You can access virtually everything uh, right from your mouse with those breadcrumbs. We don't have to, you know, a lot less mouse travel having to go over and do that. So now I can apply the motion. And when I rebuild, um, we're back to square one, square one, right, where we were before. We can really start that iterative process now that we've been talking about, utilizing that mate to get us into the position. And then that we go, now we'll go ahead in, uh, once we put that mate back on, we'll go ahead in and get access to our external references and start picking and choosing which ones we maybe want to lock um, or maintain and let, let those ones rebuild. And we can do that uh, by right clicking on the top level assembly here and choosing external references. So when we do that, uh, what happens is we get this interactive dialog box that pops up. The ability to access the references um, was available before 2019, but it looked it was really um, enhanced now uh, for those of you that are on 19 and newer. So that every component with at least one reference is going to be listed there. Um, the status, the reference entity, it's all there. 
Uh, we can also go a little further and isolate certain components. So we can just take a look at those while we're working. And we have the ability to lock or break either all or just certain ones that we want to pick. So here's just that one for the jog sketch that we want to lock. Uh, that symbol is now going to change, which we'll see here in a second. Um, we get uh, that little asterisk next to it. That just means we've locked that reference down. It's not going to propagate down any changes to the part uh, that happened at the assembly level until it's unlocked. So now we come back over into the assembly uh, and we're going to start that process. We're going to use those breadcrumbs to suppress the mate. Now, when I start moving that assembly around and when I do my rebuild, what's important here is what doesn't happen. Right? It's not propagating that down to the part. So when we rebuild it, we're not going to get those errors now, uh, not until we unlock that reference. Again, this is just sort of one of the inter iterative process that maybe you want to use, right? Locking and unlocking the references, suppressing and unsuppressing that stationary mate. <clears throat> so we're going to look at quickly another way here, a little bit more convenient way of accessing that lock reference tool. Um, hopefully everyone is familiar with those purple and blue arrows you see on the, on the screen there, um, the dynamic reference visualization. Uh, just a really nice way to see or quickly see your parent-child relationships. Uh, well, if you're on at least 2019, uh, you can now just click on that little dot that shows up there and either lock or unlock or break those references right from there, which is a real handy way of doing that. All right, so use those stationary mates to put it back in place um, where you want to use it or where you want it, and then lock those references to present, prevent those changes from propagating down to the part. All right, so we saw uh, Brandon do this a little bit earlier. Um, if you remember, uh, he looked at that 2D sketch and said we could size our, our motor up, right? So we had the sketch there. Well, now we have a 3D version of that. Right. These were actually created the old way. Uh, parts brought into the assembly and made it up, uh, not even using the block method. You can see uh, we have a motion study that applies the same concept. Uh, we're applying, or instead of forces being to the lines, uh, we're having them be applied to faces. Um, so it's the specific faces for the motor displacement, uh, faces for the resistance of that crusher. So this is a really powerful tool. Uh, we can get pretty accurate results, um, get really close results from the get-go there. And if you guys remember um, the value that Brandon saw earlier, um, if we go ahead in and look at the results here, um, it's almost like it's supposed to match, right? Um, that 118 value, right? So, so we don't have to, you, people think you have to build all these parts, right? So we can do your simulation on it. And, you know, yeah, you maybe a lot of times you do want that full on like FEA stress analysis or whatnot, but there are elements where we can use this motion, right? The simulation motion package, right? To on just simple sketches as we saw earlier. All right, so the big thing here is we're not wasting that early work, right? We started creating sketch blocks and those have been the driver the whole time. Where we can leverage those stationary mates, make sure we can get back into the place that we will want to be working. Right? And that is the big thing for the in-context designs there, right? Being in that critical position. And we didn't talk about this too much here, but breaking and removing references, right? If that part's going to be used elsewhere, right? Used as a starting point for another design or just, um, like what we had here where the motion wasn't in line with the external reference. Um, usually, typically, at the, you know, we do want to break um, or remove those and redefine those um, in references internally into the parts that's eventually. So the last thing that we want to talk about is some insights that we can get from this. And we're going to talk about a couple of things here, uh, collision detection and sensors. So with collision detection, right, we have this mechanism that we created, right? So imagine we created that with the 2D blocks, uh, we made our 3D parts, right? Then we added some hardware in this time to the design. So we now want to use this model to see if the mechanism is actually going to work, right? So with the hardware put in, right, not with blocks or anything, just put that those in normally. 
uh, made those components up, and we're going to utilize the collision detection within the move component tool there um, to see if this is going to work. And as we see, it's not, right? We can see it hitting there. Right? We took into consideration within our design here the arc of the base itself, but not of the hardware that was there. So now, right, we could go back to do that in context iterative design process to make changes if we need to. Right? We've gained that insight earlier, you know, that we wouldn't have found, right, if, without doing this. It's much better to find this out, right, obviously now, um, for, you know, we go ahead and make a prototype and find it, or worse, we go right to production and make the parts and then find this issue out. Um, it's much better to get this insight earlier on. So now we're back in the position that we want to be in. We can edit that part in the context of the design. So again, we went in, unsuppressed that mate, went into this part. Um, and when I do that, there's one thing that I didn't do. Right. I didn't lock that reference yet. So you might think it's not going to let me change this number. But it actually is. Right? And it's doing this because this isn't the reference that's external to the model. Uh, we just lock the ability to propagate changes down from the assembly um, down into the part. So it wouldn't have moved if, let's say, if the radius of this part had changed, um, if that had gotten smaller, the dimension wouldn't have moved, right? It would have stayed relative to that position, um, not to the new radius uh, that we defined, right? Not until we unlocked it and let that change propagate down. So that's again, just something to keep in mind when doing in context design, utilizing the locked references, right? It's locking that ability to propagate those changes down to the part files. So here, we're just gonna make that change um, to that value. Just give us a little bit more clearance uh, between the edge and the jog there. So now we've done that, uh, we can come back out to our model here. And if we want to get into good practice, we'll go, uh, we want to unlock that reference, let that part rebuild, right? And let that propagate down to the part files. And now, uh, again, we can lock that so it doesn't propagate now when we move the assembly. And now we can run that collision detection again, uh, make sure that we have enough clearance uh, to move over those screws. We can see we can do that, but we also wanna make sure that we didn't introduce any other interferences in from the change we made, or maybe there's other ones after that one that we didn't even know about yet. Um, so with the collision detection, right, we can see, um, we can now clear that component. The rebuilds are not gonna blow up uh, because uh, we locked those references. So use of the early 2D works, right? Doing that, use, using that 2D work, right? Helps us create our 3D work, right? That we designed. So the common theme that we've been seeing throughout this hour here. Um, so reusing that original 2D data to leverage that, um, to model our 3D and analyze our 3D. And not just using it for the blocks, right? We added in other components, right? We had hardware in there, wasn't doing anything with blocks um, and utilize that within our assembly, right? That full, full kind of assembly there. All right, so last thing we want to touch on quickly here is sensors, right? These are essentially alarms or warnings, right, for some design considerations that we want to pay attention to here. So we can have SolidWorks basically watch over those and let us know if we violate them. So let's take a look at how that works here, right? You see I have put in that reference dimension there, uh, which is essentially our locking height for the mechanism. Uh, so on our evaluate tab, we just turn on the sensors. There's a lot of things that you can see there that we can watch over, like SIM data, um, stuff like that. But here we're just grabbing that dimension. And then for the alert, we can define what we want it to look for, for that value that we've, that we've chosen. So we'll just say we need this to, to get to a certain amount or it's not going to be enough clamping force. So we can give it a value and say, warn me if it's not under this value. We could create that clearance. Um, we define, it gives us a warning there. So you can see um, here we did the rebuild. So sometimes you have to rebuild it twice to sort of get that um, error to, to pop up. Um, and one thing also that you do need to know, right, is it can't go negative. It acts sort of like an absolute value there. So if you went below there, uh, the value used um, would sort of be, would be absolute. Uh, we get that warning our sensors shows up there in the folder, right, and it warns us that, um, warns us, and then we get that normal warning box that pops up and says basically, hey, this value doesn't meet the criteria that we've defined. So a pretty uh, useful tool um, to help let SolidWorks watch over some of that design criteria that we may have.
All right, so we got our full suite of tools that are available to us. Um, so if we do this layout method, we can utilize our evaluation tools um, like we normally do in an assembly and leverage that iterative design process. All right. All right, so uh, to, as far as those insights, right, we can use that 2D work, right, and then turn that into 3D, as we've seen, and then continue to use the 3D analysis stuff that we're already been using today. And we have that full suite of evaluation tools um, available to us. All right, so we saw this image at the beginning. So hopefully now uh, we're at a point uh, where maybe we're not going to look, look like this guy here. Um, because we now uh, know how we can take care, care of something like this and we can build those mechanisms, um, taking them from 2D to 3D there. So that was a lot of stuff we showed. So uh, what are some of the things we can do to sort of practice that? Um, or you can try creating those blocks and using motion analysis yourself. Um, in SOLIDWORKS, there is a tutorial there for, in the advanced, for advanced techniques, uh, sketch blocks, and it walks you through how to create that crane you see there. Um, it's, a, it's all 2D, uh, but you can turn into 3D yourself if you want. Uh, you can try some of these concepts that we talked about, try that in-context design work, um, and try, if you guys have motion, uh, try a motion analysis on the sketch blocks. Here's Brandon, my, my uh, contact information. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to reach back out to us.